Mm-hmm. All right, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back to Wismatic Virtual Conference. Our next session is the flipped classroom, two sides of the same coin. Uh, our speaker today is Dr. Kimberly Barker. Dr. Barker has almost 25 years experience in education, including middle school, high school, and higher education in science, math, bi- biomed, biotech, psychology, and criminal justice. If you have any questions during the session, please feel free to enter those into the chat at uh, the bottom of your Zoom screen, and we will address those at the end of the talk. On that note, I'll hand it over to you, Dr. Barker. Thank you. So it's great to be here and see everybody. And I'm, I'm putting C in air quotes because some of you I can see and then some of you I cannot. Um, and I'm trying to familiarize myself with the way the Zoom is set up here. Very good. Okay, now I see the difference in the scrolling. Um, we're going to start off really quickly with some practice. And the first thing I'd like you to do for me, because I need to know how functional you are with the Zoom setup, is I need to give you, have you give me a thumbs up if you can see and hear me. So whether it's an emoji thumbs up um, or a physical thumbs up, that would be great. Okay, so I see thumbs up from a couple, there we go. So if you don't have your camera on, the emoji works better. It will also push you to the top of the list if you give me the emoji. And so it stays there a little bit longer. Um, The next thing I'm gonna ask you all to do is turn on your mics because we have a roll question coming up. And we're gonna start with the opportunity to vote on the roll question. And I'm gonna need you to, again, either uh, with your camera and showing me your finger, one or two, or verbally say one or two, whether you would like to do question number one or question number two. And so I'm gonna go down the list. Becky, what do you vote? One. Okay, Mohan? One. Stephanie? Good. Arlene? Two. Okay, Amy? One, did you say one? One. One, okay, good. Um, Paulina? One. One, and I think... I'm trying to see, there's a name down here. It looks like a Megumi. Um, I'm so sorry. The, uh, it has covered your name at the bottom, so. It's okay, my name is Meg. Uh, I'll, I'll take two. You'll take two? Okay, so I think so far we've got two twos. All right. Um, Fedustrad, F-D-U-S. Uh, yeah, one. One, okay, good. Uh, is that Yong or Jong? Yong. Yong. And what do you- number two. Two. Okay, Steve. I'm going to take one. Okay. Uh, Yainwai, I, I know that I did not do that well. Could you say your name for me? Sorry, I think you might be calling uh, me Xianwei. Xianwei. Um, I'm so sorry. I, I just joined the session. What was the question again? Um, it's, it's a simple one. Do you want to do question number one or question number two for roll? <laughs> um, it doesn't matter. Either one is fine. I'll, okay. I'll take, yeah. Thank you. Okay. And May, I think you're my last name. May, do you choose one or two? Okay, we'll come back to that in just a minute. So the bulk of everybody chose question number one, and we're gonna go through this again with turning on your microphones because we've already practiced it. But all it is is a one word answer for this roll question. And it is, does the toilet paper roll go over or does it go under? So all you need to do is say over or under. Meg? Me? Uh Uh-huh, you're next in line this time. Under. Okay, Uh, Fedustra? One. (laughs) <laughs> so, over or under? Uh, over. Over. Okay. And Young? Um, over. Okay. Steve? Over. Okay. Zhang Wei? I'm trying. Under. On the, under. Okay. <laughs> Stephanie? Really does not matter. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, let's see. Who have I missed? Caitlin? Over. Over. Paulina. Over. 
Okay, Becky? Under because I have cats. Ah, so you already have a reason for your answer, May. Okay, so the idea here, you've each given me a, an answer, and what I need is for someone to explain. So I've already heard uh, that we have cats, and so the, the toilet paper roll needs to go under because if you have cats, what happens? Anybody, turn on your microphone. They'll unravel the whole thing. They definitely will. Now, somebody who said under, or um, somebody who said over, tell me your reasoning. I'm going to look for volunteers or I'm going to draft you. Okay, let's try Caitlin. Did you say over, Caitlin? I said over. Very uh, nice. So you're drafted. <laughs> <laughs> you, you make marks on the wall when you touch the wall. There you go. Okay, so I want you to hold, hold the thought on the roll question, and we're going to move on to the rest of the material. We'll come back to this in a little bit. So the next slide, what I want you to do is look at this agenda. This is what we're going to cover in our session today. And very briefly, I'm going to let you take a couple minutes to look at it and kind of prepare yourself for the material we're going to cover. And this is because as a psychology-oriented behaviorist person, um, I realized that when we, we prepare people for what is coming, then they have the idea of looking for it. Their brains are primed, is what we call when we're training people on memory techniques. Um, so for example, imagine that uh, you have just met a new person that you're interested in and you find out that they drive a red truck. Now, everywhere you go, you're gonna see red trucks. Every single red truck out there, you're going to see it. It's going to catch your attention because your brain is primed to receive that information. Whereas before, you may have noticed, never, ever noticed a red truck. So today, some of the things that we're going to be discussing as our red trucks are, um, we're going to skip past my background, but a little bit about brain research, which we're discussing in some format right now. Very basically, what is a flipped classroom? Some basic relevant pedagogy. I want to, don't want to spend a lot of time on that a little bit of the history, some current research, but what I wanna focus on is how to help you all in your classrooms. I wanna know if you've used this technology or this technique before, and if you have not, why not? And if you have, how's it going for you? Do you have any ideas, questions, things that I can do to assist you with this? So we're gonna go all the way back to the emojis again. How many of you, and give me an emoji, hands up or thumbs up, how many of you have used Let's try, first of all, how many of you are familiar with flipped classrooms that you understand what the concept is? Okay, good. Arlene, I see you. Okay, Stephanie, I see you. Fedustrid, Young, Steve. So a handful of you and no pun on the thumbs. So we're going to start with some basics then. Um, and this is because I, I don't want to leave anybody out and I, I don't want to move too quickly through the material. So um, Arlene, did you say that you had familiarity with the flipped classroom? Yes. Okay. Can you take just a second and, and give your an overview? What do you think one is or how have you heard of it or how have you applied it in your classroom? Um, so the students do kind of the lecture portion outside of the classroom by watching videos with a guided worksheet that goes with it. So they have to answer questions, being math, do problems. And then in the classroom, um, I start out with an activity that, um, well, most of the time I've been hybrid or not hybrid, mm -hmm. virtual since I started this. And then um, about half the class time I use for the activity that the students are doing together, but it's not working so well virtually. And then the rest of the time, they're doing homework and I'm available to go into a breakout room with them if they have questions. Um, and if I talk about problems that I see uh, that I think are applicable to most of the students as we go along. Okay, that's a pretty good summary there. I appreciate that. Does anybody else have experience with either, have you you've heard of a flipped classroom, you've been in a flipped classroom, or you have experience utilizing it in your own classrooms. If you do, turn on your mic or raise your hand, and I'm gonna try to skim through what I'm seeing here on the screen just to address you correctly. Okay. Do you mean experience different from that? Yes. 
Okay. So, Fidustra, do you have your hand up still? So, do you have a different experience from what we were just discussing? Oh, I mean, I, I guess I've never taught a flipped classroom exactly. I mean, I thought about it, but I know a lot of people in our department have. Okay. And so I'm, I'm sort of aware of the idea, I guess, but. Okay, and which department is that? What, what do you teach? I teach math. Math, okay, great, excellent opportunity. Um, so I'm just trying to get a handle on what, what your basic understanding is as a class of a flipped classroom. And that helps me a good bit. Okay, so we're gonna go on to the next screen here really quickly. My background, again, um, as, as they introduced me, I have a background in um, computer engineering, in biology, chemistry, math, um, as a student and then as an educator, and then also with psychology and criminal justice. So I've had the opportunity to apply this particular strategy in many platforms. And the reason that I'm mentioning that is because sometimes um, people will come to a session or we talk, we talk about flipped classrooms and uh, they go, this is not gonna work for my, my material, my technology, my class, whatever it is I'm studying. And I take that as a challenge. <laughs> so if you're in a class that you feel that it is not gonna work, we're gonna have the opportunity to try to work through some of those um, bugs that you may be finding uh, that maybe just an idea hadn't occurred to you. Um, and we're gonna, hopefully, I'm gonna be able to put you on some small group sessions to chat about this a little bit, but I wanna get a little bit further through the content before we get there. I also have had the opportunity um, to work in this field and in many others. So I teach in this format, not only as an educator, but in educating educators and working with the trainers. And, um, and it's funny, Stephanie, I saw you move up to go, I can't read all of that. There's, I broke my own rules. There's too many words on my PowerPoint. But the reason I'm putting this here is because I like to make my PowerPoints available to people after presentations. So um, if you can, you know, access it through Hawks, or if you want to contact me directly and just reach out to Hawks and I'm sure they'll put you in touch with me because there are things that I'm gonna mention here that's again, pedagogy, history, things like that. You can look this up, you're, you're educators. And so I just wanna guide you to where the content is. I don't wanna belabor the point. I'd rather have some practical hands-on application opportunities with you that might answer some burning questions um, as we're going through all of this. Another thing that's interesting is that I've been teaching since 1999 as an educator, prior to that as a consultant and a trainer. Um, so I've had the opportunity to do this in the seated traditional format in small group sessions, in webinars, um, fully online, synchronous online, hybrid classes. So um, I can tell you it is more challenging in certain arenas, but it is doable. And it's interesting in my uh, experience for the students. And that's the feedback that I get. I will tell you, students either hate me or they love me. There is no warm, there's no middle ground. But I ask the ones that start out hating me, and that's pretty obvious, um, to hang in there. And usually I can turn them around by the end. And, and we all know as educators, um, you can't always keep all the students with you. Um, they, they don't always buy into a particular methodology, but overwhelmingly I've gotten positive feedback from students um, about this to the extent that there are students I've taught in junior high that then moved to my high school so I could teach them in high school, came back and were my students in college and then came back to teach with me. So this is not about me. I believe it's in this style that is, that is helpful for them because it's the way that we are meant to learn in so many different aspects. So you might recognize here um, the typical uh, Bloom's taxonomy, right? Over on the right side of the screen, but it's flipped in this case with a flipped classroom format. When we were discussing this at the beginning, and I believe that was Arlene that was speaking, um, she was relating uh, the way this goes in her classroom and how she's utilized it in her classroom. And when I speak to students and I say, have you worked in a flipped classroom before? They often say, yeah, that's where we teach ourselves. <laughs> and, and I laugh because, um, yeah, kinda. I mean, you, you, are, you do have the bulk of the responsibility as a student, but it's also very empowering. Um, and uh, so often where it is difficult for educators, I think, is when we're trying to put the responsibility and the empowerment towards our students, yet we're still trying to provide them with information and not making them 
have to teach themselves. So it's kind of a, a conundrum there. Um, anyhow, so you'll see here that with the flipped classroom taxonomy, uh, it looks inverted because the memorization, the, um, the uh, vocabulary, things like that are the basis for everything else but they're not going to be the focus. You can see that the focus is the apex or at the top of this where we're actually creating things from the other material. Could actually draw it a different way where the base is, you know, strong enough or sturdy enough to, to bear everything else as in a normal taxonomy. But in my mind, that, that leads to thinking that we spend all the time on the what I consider the smaller, finer details, which is remembering so forth and so on. Okay, take a break from this for just a second. I'm gonna ask you all a few questions. As you feel that you can tell me what each of these is, um, turn on your mic and just yell it out. So for example, if you can identify what number one is, just turn on your mic and tell me as soon as you get it. If you know what number two is, yell it out. And I'm just gonna wait. Number one, blood is thicker than water. Yes, very good. Just between you and me. Good, just between you and me, very good. Cornerstone? Yes, very good. And number four is the one that seems to trick people. Tenants? I'm sorry? Tenants? Yes, 10 ants. Very ten good. Ants. Yeah. Okay, great group work. All right, let's move on to something else. Um, so when we're talking about the flipped classroom, in reference to brain research and why it is an effective uh, I hate to keep using the word pedagogy, but it's an effective philosophy is because we know from certain aspects of brain research that we tend to remember 5% of what we hear we are uh, from a lecture, 10% um, of what we might read ourselves because we're actively engaged, even on a small level, 20% um, through audiovisual support, a PowerPoint, a video, that sort of thing. Um, again, I'm not going to walk you through this whole graph. But this is part of the reasoning behind the flipped uh, concept and why um, I emphasize teaching it in a certain way. Okay, again, a flipped classroom here, you can just look at the definition. It's a type of blended learning where the emphasis, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing here, the onus is put on the students to prepare prior to class. Now, I'm old, so when I was in school, that's what we did. We read before you came to class and you were responsible for having covered the material for then activities or whatever. So it's almost a return to an older style and older fashion of teaching, but without the standardized lecture, okay? So, and when I say without the standardized lecture, I mean in class, I don't ever lecture. I speak more in my presentations than I do in any of my classes because my students, thankfully, have learned or do learn through the process of the class to come to class with questions, come to class prepared to do activities. And we'll see what that looks like in just a second. So the idea in a flipped classroom is that you are kind of inverting the way we typically think of teaching and education these days, which is the teacher comes in with this bag of tricks and they entertain for an hour and open up the brain and stuff in information and close it back up and we wait for the students to regurgitate that to us. In a flipped classroom, the students read or watch videos, um, as was mentioned before, or whatever you have chosen for their pre-work. Then they come to class having some background. Again, we've primed their brain for receiving material. And then in class, we have the opportunity to do really cool and exciting activities rather than a PowerPoint or a lecture. Okay. Sometimes in class, the students create the really cool and exciting activities. And we'll talk about that in just a moment as well. Then after class, you have a reflective portion. So one of the things I want you to take away from here is there is actually three distinct sections to a flipped classroom the pre-work, the classwork, and then the post-work or the reflective activities. So just keep that in mind as you're thinking about your classrooms and, and where you might be able to apply some of these strategies. Okay, so again, with the pedagogy, I just inverted it and there's a little explanation off to the side that's there for you if you wanna look at it later. A little bit of the history of the flipped classroom, how it was invented, how it has now become more common in certain areas, what the reasoning was behind. And these are um, 
the references or the citations for the references, which are at the end, if you have an interest in looking at the how and the why of it. Okay, again, some more current research applications to math, medicine, I know it's small, sorry, <laughs> math, medicine, science. Um, I had a student or uh, a participant in a previous presentation who was an ELA instructor, and we talked about how to invert the classroom with regard to vocabulary and then uh, creating scenarios in the classroom. So that was pretty cool. Now, for this presentation, what we're going to focus on is this acronym here, uh, LEARN. And I apologize, they've decided to do construction this morning, um, I'm guessing because I had a presentation. So, um, so I do apologize. But the idea of the behind this acronym is to kind of keep some things in mind. So you can see that the instructor is one side of the coin and the student is the other side of the coin. And we each have our own distinct responsibilities. If I don't do take care of my side of the coin correctly, the students can't do theirs correctly. And if they don't engage correctly on their side, I can't present the information correctly. So we have to have a partnership from the very beginning where we understand what the expectations are and how to go about meeting them. So we've already flipped this classroom today a little bit, meaning we started the class before I even had your really your names or anything about you with your jumping in and giving me information on the toilet paper roll, okay? It's the first roll question I ask every year with every class that I teach, regardless of the subject matter. And the second question that you all as a group determined not to do was, um, how do you squeeze your toothpaste from the top, the middle, and the bottom? <laughs> <laughs> and, and it leads to really developed conversation. I have students, students share their screen. Y'all did not as a group choose uh, question number two, so there was no screen sharing necessary. Um, but what happens with question number one is we discuss uh, why do you do this? You know, some people have cats. Some people's mamas said that that's the way the toilet paper roll goes and you just, <laughs> you know, so prior knowledge. Um, when we get to question number two on the second day, they're ready to talk. They want to tell me their opinion on these questions. So I ask something a little more complicated. Which way do you squeeze the toothpaste? top, middle, or bottom. That's the only option that I give them. And invariably, I will still have students who say, sometimes I do it this way, sometimes I do it between the top and the middle, and I have them try to mark this information. We then discuss what happens if this is a survey? What happens if this is actual research? Is your data valid? Did you have all the options? We talk about operational definitions. Um, define the top, the middle, or the bottom. You didn't even stop me to ask me which was which. How do we know we're talking about the same things? I know I speak quickly and I apologize for that too. But the idea here is that I've already engaged them in preparing for class without knowing that they've prepared for class. They all, almost everybody, has an opinion on the toilet paper roll. People in Oprah's audience 20 years ago got into a fight over this. They were that adamant, okay? Um, and the toothpaste, people are shocked that they went ahead and answered a question with no definition provided didn't know which the top. And I already have students sharing their screen, drawing a picture of the toothpaste tube. I have somebody else annotating on this individual screen. So without thinking that they're preparing for class, they've come to class prepared to answer a question. And after that, I gotcha, because now it's easy and we're just gonna move on adding this into the material. So the next slide, I want y'all just take a moment of the and um, take a look at this. Tell me if you've ever seen this before. If you have, give me a thumbs up or just <laughs> turn your mic and say yes, exactly. So in class, and this is my experience um, as a student with learning disabilities who is now a doctor, um, it was my experience in class. The instructor would say two plus two equals four. They'd show us how that worked out and everything was good get home and the homework was a little bit more difficult, but I'd call a friend or something and we'd get through it. On the exam, Omar has four apples, his train is seven minutes early, please calculate the mass of the sun. Can anybody else relate to that? If you can, just give me a thumbs up or turn on your microphone and say, yes, that's how it feels. Okay, good. So I see a couple people have said that they, they can relate to that. This is one of the bonuses of the flipped classroom then. So instead of being in the classroom while the teacher is lecturing and saying, that makes sense, and then you go home and you have no clue what's going on, and then you get to an exam and you're either even further in the weeds, we now have a way to address this. 
So for us, before class, the student is reading the pre-material. You know, God willing, and the creek don't rise. This is what we're hope we hope is happening. And through positive reinforcement, more carrot than stick, we're trying to encourage the student to approximate this behavior. Before class, read, watch the videos, find your own videos about this topic if you don't like the videos I've given them, and then come to class prepared to share your videos. Um, some students take this as a challenge and they jump right in. Other students do not. I draft the students that have taken it as a challenge and I give a lot of positive reinforcement to those that are not ready. So during class, we're in small breakout groups or I divide the class by the left side and the right side or taller and shorter. I take in you know, cards or dice or whatever. So I'm not choosing ever who's going with whom. I just break up into multiple groups. And I know that's counterintuitive to what we've learned as educators, that small groups should have uh, a medium level student to a higher level student and vice versa. But um, it also works this way. And then after class, they have a reflective activity. Now, the way I utilize my classes is during class, they are working towards the reflective activity. Therefore, your lead students, the one that, ones that have already come in with a better video than the one that you had to teach the class about this material, they're already working with their colleagues. And that's what I call them in class. You're working with your colleague and what I want you to do is develop X, Y, Z. You're working with your colleague and I want you all to stump me on a question. I'm happy to be stumped because as soon as they do, I send them to the internet for a treasure hunt and we look at the research that we found in real time. And we apply that research in a group to work on the activity that is then going to be graded. And they that is their reflection activity. So whether it's a writing assignment, a discussion board, whatever it is, they're taking the content prior to class, applying it to a conversation in class with myself and their peers. Then they are reflecting on that by putting in something in writing um, or a video or a PowerPoint. The students have tremendous skills that we had no idea they had that are just lovely to see the things that they can come up with. Um, and that's the basic format for this. So I'm gonna get past it and go into another section. So a little bit of story time. Um, when I started teaching school, uh, I was first teaching junior high. And uh, at the time, the buzzwords were science through inquiry. And that's coming back around because it's been over 20 years and we know everything comes back around. <laughs> Um, the idea at the time, though, was that we would take kits or boxes of material and we would present it to the students and then boom, they, you know, they played with the box and they suddenly knew how to calculate the mass of the sun. Um, well, I found that that didn't, right, that didn't work very well, as you might imagine. So my county, which was always jumping onto the bandwagon of everything, um, came up with this idea for a standardized um, lesson plan. And so the first thing that you had to have on the board every day, and we were evaluated on this, was an EQ. Now, if you have familiarity with what an EQ is, just yell it out. Tell me, tell me what that represents or stands for. Okay, so none of y'all taught in Moore County, North Carolina. Then. So it starts with essential and it ends with question. This is the guiding focus of the lesson today. Now, I want to say, when I teach in a flipped classroom, I embed all of this. So I do have an essential question on the board in some format, meaning this is the red truck you're looking for. This is what we're gonna take away from this, this conversation today. The second thing is I link to, again, part of our format was prior knowledge. So I start with, for example, which way do you roll the toilet paper roll? Or, hey, who remembers what we talked about in class on Tuesday? Or what did you read over the weekend? So I'm linking it to something they've already done. So they already have a basis of comfort and familiarity. We have the body of the assignment or the body of the activity, an assessment, which is either their reflection activity or an in-class debate conversation, quiz, whatever, and then a ticket out the door. This is how you get out of the classroom or out of the assignment by letting me know that you know what we're doing. You all have already given me, for those of you who have been in sales before, you've already been confirming all the way throughout. You've been giving me thumbs up, smiley faces, turn on your mic, give me a yes or a no. So it's just a matter of I'm trying to keep you engaged this entire time, but I'm also not teaching the entire time while we're in class. And here's why it's important. And here's the story. 
So when I was teaching junior high, I was teaching IV and also the general ed classroom. And I had an evaluation with our county guru. I mean, she was just, if you thought about a principal, you thought about Dr. Fry. She's Dr. Fry now. Um, and she was observing my class. So I was absolutely terrified. <laughs> and I was working with IB students and we had this really cool activity. Now, mind you, I've gone through all these steps, right? We had this really cool activity. We were making hail and test tubes. These are the really bright kids and they really wanted to impress her and they really liked me so they wanted us to do a good job, right? So we're in the classroom and this is what let me know that I needed to alter this a little bit, this format. We were in the classroom, we're having the activity, she did the evaluation, everybody was excited and they left, she left, and I went to look at their lab manuals to see what they had written. So part of the activity was you had to write the initial temperature and then you had to write the final temperature. For initial temperature, without exception, my super bright IB students wrote their personal initials. Like I would do KB and then 79 degrees. And it never occurred to me that they needed preparation to have the material covered before launching them into an experiment or they didn't have a red truck to look for. Does that make sense a little bit? Okay, so I took the the format in our classroom or in our in our um, county that was science through inquiry, and I'm like, this is really valuable. That it's hands-on activities, it follows brain pedagogy. But as I went through as an educator, I found that there were some pieces missing, so I started to research a little more. Then I came across the flipped classroom format because it has all of these important pieces. So for one, it has a flexible environment. Meaning, I've already given them background information. If we get to class and they find that this, this segue off of the content is even more interesting, that's perfectly fine with me because they're still relating it to the content. We can still address the questions. Um, the learning culture has to be appropriate. They say children don't care what you know until they know that you care. And I think this is with adults too. There has to be intentional content. I'm not giving them a box, a box of toys to play with and then trying to see what they come up with, with no guidance, no direction. I'm just not telling them what to come up with. And then they need a professional educator, which you all are. So we're, we've got all four points there. Um, hang on, let me scroll down here and move on to the next, next thing. Okay, so specific formats. How many of you, and I'm going to ask for a show of hands again because I'm trying to address specific questions. Give me a thumbs up emoji this time. How many of you have taught in more than one of these formats? So there's a traditional seated classroom, blended learning, which is either a hybrid classroom or a synchronous type classroom. I can see two of you and fully distance or digital learning. Okay, so two of you have taught in more than one, three. Okay, so that means and I'm just, I'm guessing here, I'm using my power of observation, powers of observation and math, that if only four or five of you have done this, there are a number of people with us today that are currently teaching in only, only one of these formats and don't have the range of expectations. Now, just addressing the people who are only teaching in one of these formats or only have experience with one. If you are teaching in a fully face-to-face -face classroom, Give me a thumbs up. And again, I'm scrolling through here, I apologize. Okay. Uh, if you are teaching in a fully digital version, give me a thumbs up. Okay. Okay, uh, Five, about five people in that capacity. And last but not least, if you are teaching in a hybrid, whether that means you have some synchronous time with your students and the rest is online, or um, some class time with your students and the rest is online, give me a thumbs up. Okay, very few of you. All right, um, and here's why. I was, again, personal experience, I was trained to teach everything my students need can be found online, everything. Their textbook, the additional resources, any videos I'm providing, anything. Doesn't mean you have to do this this way or you're gonna be comfortable with it. But when, when we all got sent home, 
I, all my information for my students was already online. They didn't have to transition. They didn't have to train. We're already past that point, but just a thought. If your materials, if your content is already housed in one location, if you get sick and can't show up, you can send your link to the sub. Your students already have the link to the classroom. They can still access the material. There won't be days lost. There won't be downtime. Okay, so that's one suggestion I would make. The other suggestion, I'm sorry, my, my mouse is trying to not work with me. The other um, suggestion with regard to the formats that you're using is it helps prepare students. I guess we don't even say 20, 20th century skills on 21st century skills. Um, it helps prepare students for the technology that is going to be necessary in their lives coming up. And we learned that the hard way. Um, by taking seated students, adult learners, and um, public education students, and sending them home to learn. Because we learned they weren't doing anything on their own that we weren't doing for them in the classroom, which puts the emphasis on us. And is also another selling point of the flipped classroom. Because what's really cool about this is, although I'm providing the jumping off point, they are running with it. And and I don't mean in the first meeting, you're not gonna have 30 students that are like, oh, I'm ready to research. Like this is, this is what I wanna do. But as you start to engage them and as you start taking time out of each class so that they get to speak and engage and, and give you their thoughts about it, <clears throat> you'll find that you'll start to lean that way. They will become more ownership directed with regard to this material. Um, they will start to look for things to learn and look for things to bring to class that are related to the content and the material and you can make that happen, make that connection for them. Okay, a question for you all. And again, I know that you have the capacity to share your screen, but I can see that we're already at 10 minutes after two on my end. So I know I'm an hour ahead of, of the central time. Um, so I, I want to also get through some more of this material. Examples of pre-work. How many of you all have some examples, some things that you give students to do to prepare for class? If you do, turn on your microphone for me for just a second and, and let's hear some of the things that you have, that you've shared with your students or had your students do. So Arlene shared a couple things. Has anybody else had any experience with uh, setting pre-work or having your students do pre-work before class? I ask my students to watch videos before class usually. Okay, and I'm trying to find who that is because I'm scrolling it's through. It's Becky. The face. <laughs> it's Becky, okay, thank you. Um, I didn't have it set up to track the speaker and I apologize. Okay, so you have them watch videos on the subject matter or do you have them look up videos? Um, like, do you provide the videos or are they videos that you've made for them? Tell me a little bit more. All of the above. When we're just doing like normal subject matter, I have videos obviously that I've created that explain and I want them to watch them before we do class because they know I'm going to start the class by asking them questions. Mm -hmm. um, but then I also ask them, uh, everyone find a video on Khan Academy or YouTube that, mm -hmm. is, that explains this concept to you in a really great way. And then they come and share that. So those and are... The main ways I do the videos. And, and how often do you have it that they come back with cooler videos than anything you've seen before? Always. <laughs> Always. Yeah. And I used to even, uh, to some extent, I get, I get point. I, I'm not a grade oriented person. I'm an outcomes oriented person and I don't measure outcomes by grades. Can the student have a conversation with me about it? Now, grades are important, but also you'll find that there are students that may not be good test takers, as you know. I'm not a good test taker, I worry too much, um, but I can write and I can explain uh, typically. Um, all of that said, so for my students that would come with a cool video, I'm happy to give five points, you know, something like that. I also do announcement quizzes and things like that prior to class. If you saw this quiz, send me this email in this exact format so they get in the habit of saying, dear Dr. Barker, I hope this email finds you well. <laughs> Thank you so much for the extra 10 points that you're gonna add to my lowest grade and whatever, because it keeps them engaged, okay? And that's my, that's my goal, is to keep them engaged, keep them responsible for their um, gathering of the material. You're about to hear my dog, and I apologize for that too. My day is just, just the way it's happening today. Um, okay, so that's some, some good ideas uh, with regard to pre-work. Here are some other ideas. Okay, Hank. Okay. I'm so sorry. <laughs> so, 
I don't like to videotape myself, so I don't create video lectures. I know many instructors who create phenomenal video lectures, and, and that's great. If you can do that, more power to you. Um, I, it's just not my strong suit, but I will look up things in Khan Academy or Brain Games or Crash Course. These are all terrific series, program series. And again, I'm happy if you want to reach out and go over some of these, these names or ideas at any other time um, to provide some suggestions. But you can Google uh, Crash Course on Neuropsychology Basics, and you'll have a guy that talks even faster than I do, but has really cool, um, like, cartoons and animation that make it very interesting the material he's covering and much more interesting than my just sitting and explaining I really need you to stop hey okay um so here are some ideas and again you can find them in here now the next part of the flipped classroom is what are some classroom activities so just like before if you've used a flipped classroom and if you haven't used a flipped classroom what are some classroom activities that you have or that you do that you think would lend themselves to this type of a learning environment what are some things that you can think of that you do in class that you think are pretty cool or interesting? I use um, cahoots that I make up. Um, I use qui quizzes. Mm -hmm. um, I use Desmos. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm sure there's other things I do too. <laughs> Those are so probably the top three. So that is fantastic. And, and it just shows that your technology skills are above mine. I've never made any of those things, but I love them. I love them when other people do them. Um, so I, I'll have my students do them in class. They'll have a Cahoots challenge. Or <clears throat> I had one student, and you'll see this. We probably won't get to it, but it's in the PowerPoint when I have examples of student work. I had one student who she learns by using Quizlet. So when she was doing her pre-work, she made Quizlets for herself and said, hey, can I share them for the class in the student coffee house? Because I always have an interactive discussion board for them. And I said, sure. And then somebody told another class and the other class was jealous. <laughs> they didn't have the Quizlet that the first class had. So I got permission from the student to share with the other class and ultimately wound up um, building discussion boards that would allow the different classes to, to chat. So very good. Uh, any other examples that people have of things that you do in class? Bamboozled is another good one I like. Yeah. Um, and uh, how about any physical activities? Did you ever have them get up and move around the classroom? Have you ever done like popcorn or any of those things? Stephanie, you, what were you saying? I'll just say yes, sometimes. Yeah. And I, in my mind, I remember and I can't even what, remember what the old movie was and you all might remember. Um, but um, Morgan Freeman is running across the top of a table in his classroom while his students are trying to race him to the board to put answers on the board. I don't run across the table. Okay, <laughs> my classroom took, don't worry. Um, but things like that, because they're up and they're moving around. Popcorn is another really good example of that. And you can even do that in an online environment. Let me scroll down here and I'll show you some of the, the different activities. So open form discussion like we're having here. OK, um, and you again, you brought your knowledge from prior experience. So you're prepared for class and we're having conversation as opposed to my simply lecturing um, breakout groups. I use I use breakout groups once or twice in every class session. I don't make them long. They're only five to ten minutes. Ten is the most. And I'll pop my head into their breakout sessions just to see that they're on task and I'll go someplace else because our online environment has allowed or disallowed students to have that classroom connection that the seated environment allowed where I can you know, put desks together, have a conversation with your team. Our breakout sessions are a little bit different. I have my students in their breakout session um, discuss their personal research for their capstone project or um, I'll assign three articles prior to class. They'll have an objective they have to cover within each of the articles. It might be highlight five things you found are cool. Uh, for my neuroscience students, it's, okay, I want you to walk through this case study. What, ex what tests would you apply? What would your diagnosis be? I need you to support that. What would your uh, therapy recommendations be? So it depends on the student, but the idea is they've done a little bit of prep work, then they talk about it with their peers. Then I tell them, go home and submit the work you talked about with your peers, but you have the latitude to add what you want or don't. So they have the benefit of group work, without the drawback of Sally didn't do her work and therefore my grade is affected. 
Um, we do experiments that are facilitator led to some extent, which is, um, okay, I can see there's something in the chat and I'll check that in just a second, or somebody could tell me what it says, that would be even better. Um, we have experiments that are facilitator led, so I'll give them examples. I do something that I, my mother used to do with her elementary school students, it was called Feely Mealy. So we're talking about senses, they have a brown bag, they're working with a partner, they have to stick their hand in the bag and identify 10 objects and write it down, their partner has to do the same. And then we talk about why might someone not have determined the same um, object. Females or males may not have experience with, I don't know, a corn cob holder, or because of your culture, you may not have experience with um, paper clips or whatever the reason is. We talk about how that relates to the science of senses of perception at whatever grade level. Then I ask them to create their own experiments and they work in their small groups to do that and they write about it as a reflection activity. We did an activity on termites one time, which is really cool. And you can look this one up if you have an interest and you're not afraid of termites. And you, you bring them into class in a little while and you give each group um, a box of um, like black uh, ballpoint pens, blue ballpoint pens, red ballpoint pens, markers, pencils, and different other implements. And I show them by modeling that I'm going to put the termite down under the cap of like a, a film cap. And I'm going to draw a circle around it with the black or blue ballpoint pen. And I can train that termite to go around in the circle to follow the ink. And then I'm going to trail it off and the termite will follow it trailed off. And then I ask them to figure out why. So I give them their own stuff to play with. And they test all of these things. Will it follow the red ink? Will it follow the, the um, pencil? Will it follow whatever else that I've given it? They only follow the black or the blue ink. And I'm going to spoiler alert here because of the pheromones and the black or the blue ink uh, is similar to what the termites would normally follow. I don't tell them that though. They have to use the information that they read in the chapter or watched in the videos to make that connection, run the experiment, test it, and then write about it. So just another example, teach the class. You talked about cahoots. They can create their own PowerPoints in class with their groups to teach their other groups. I have really good examples of that in this PowerPoint as well. Um, anyway, so many different ideas. Now I'm gonna scroll down really quickly to ask you all reflection activities. What would you think of, or what are some things that you think of when I talk about the after activities, after the training and the practice, and what, what type of reflective activities do you offer your students? Okay, so a standard would probably be a quiz, right? Reflect on what you know, prove what you know. Um, I don't like quizzes, so I try to avoid this. I do offer quizzes for my students who love quizzes because they need to have that opportunity as well, but I score them low. I mean, I, I, it's a, a small portion of their grade. So we do things like this, discussion boards. Every class I teach has a discussion board every week. They have to post in it. They have to post scientific information in it based upon what the question is. They have to cite and reference in APA because I'm a psychologist, not an English teacher. So they have to learn APA while we're doing this. They don't like that. Um, and then they have to reply to two colleagues and they have to provide scientific information. The benefit here is they can't get away with just saying, hey, that's a cool post. I also have cats, you know? They have to say, well, have you considered this perspective based upon this research? Sixth graders can do this. They can all do this because they do it already when they reference their favorite songs, their favorite artist, their favorite movie, why their mother taught them that the toilet paper roll has to go a certain way. And I relate it back to the beginning of class. You already cited in reference. You told me your reasoning. Now I need you to learn how to do it in this format and do it professionally. So you're not just saying, I think, or I feel. Why do you think or you feel these things? Um, student develop PowerPoints. Again, reflection activity. They can submit a PowerPoint they created with their team. With the caveat, they're allowed to add a little bit more to it or take things away that they don't think were appropriate. Journaling, we all know what that is. Here are the ones that people may not be familiar with teach your dog or your mom, your sister, your brother, your dad, whatever. They need to come back to me with a document that says, or they need to submit it online that says, Susie taught me how to uh, tie my shoes, or Susie taught me about termites. That's really cool that they have pheromones that lets me know that they are reinforcing the material that was covered in class that I didn't teach them. They figured it out through the flipped format. They made that connection and now they've taught somebody else. 
because we also know through brain research that the more you teach somebody else, the more you know about your content. Because if you didn't know the answer before, once a child stumps you or a student stumps you in class in front of everybody else, you're gonna find the answer. I get around that because I've had um, colleagues say, this is like the Socratic method on crack. And I'm like, yeah, kind of, but I'm not really as smart as he was. So I get around that when they stump me by saying, that's a really good question. Let's have a treasure hunt. Can everybody find the answer online for whatever it is? Okay. And, uh, and I have no problem with telling them I don't know the answer because I don't. And they are very inquisitive students. If, if you let them be, or if we let them be, they, they really are. I am whizzing through this material as quickly as I can. You can see pros and cons. You probably are aware of these. The only reason I wanted to go through it quickly is I want you to see that I have included in here students pre-work which I call owning their education. Um, and this is before class even started. You can see how many posts and responses are there. These are first semester general psychology college students who most of them are high school students because now we teach high school students in the general psychology classes on the college level and they get credit for it, um, which means they have to be at the standard. They have taken it upon themselves to already initiate conversation in their student coffee house with their colleagues um, about whatever it is, where to find information, how to do a certain thing. Here's another example. Uh, different students that felt that they learned better visually, so they just, without it being an assignment, went home and created these to assist their colleagues with how to cite and reference an APA or how to understand a book walk, chapter 15, when we're talking about psychological disorders, how do we walk through that chapter and utilize it? Again, I know I'm talking more than I than I typically normally do, but I'm, I just wanted to draw your attention to these. Um, here's an example of what the class looks like, one of the classes, um, and how to change it on the fly if it's not going well. I have examples here of student work when they had to teach the class and how they built their different PowerPoints. So for those of you who are interested and want to follow up with any of this material, you can look at the content there. I'm not saying it's a brag on me or my abilities as a teacher. I'm sharing this to brag on the students. Like they, they were incredible and they really stepped up to the challenge, which is why I said at the beginning, they either love me or they hate me. And I will tell you that in the first couple of days, I have students who are ready to crucify me. Like they are, they are done. They want me out of here. They don't want me to ever teach again. But I convince them if they stay with me a little bit longer, then I can usually win them over. And again, not me, but this methodology, because it really allows them to explore. Um, for example, their capstone project, their final research, they can choose whatever they want to in whatever class it is, but they have to be able to rate it, relate it to our class. So I teach psychology and I teach neuropsychology and I teach abnormal and police psychology, you know, currently and behavioral analysis. I have students that their goal is to choose a topic that I can't relate back to the topic of, con of psychology and they, they lose every single time because you can relate anything to psychology. You can relate anything to mathematics or statistics, depending on how you look at it. And that's my challenge to them. Find something that matters to you and then run with it and learn how to apply the material that we're in um, throughout the course. And I think I got us almost to the end where, oh yeah, let's chat. Do you have any questions? I've tried to give you the opportunity to engage throughout. I see there are some things in the chat. So I'm gonna try to open it and uh, see if I can read these questions. Um, so let me scroll up to the top, designing for, yes, very good. So who, Caitlin, did you share that? Uh, so these are links to the next sessions. Uh, I just uh, to allow people to move on to the next sessions. We have about five more minutes um, before the next sessions begin. Okay. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, okay. in the session. If you have any questions, uh, please ask them now, either in the chat or uh, live with Dr. Barker. Okay. All right. Well, I hope that I answered some of the questions for you and that I provided you with some material or at least some things that might be thought provoking. Caitlin, can, is there a way that we can provide the PowerPoint so that if, if people want to go back and look at some of the student work or look at some of the things, because again, you know, breeze through it pretty quickly to try to cover all the material. Yeah, we can make that available. Um, we can add it to the website uh, homepage and allow the, you know you guys to, to get them there. 
Okay, good. And again, I'm, I'm available. I'm happy to chat with anybody if you have one on one questions. And I hope that I did spark a little interest for those of you who don't have experience and gave you some um, other options for people who do have experience and it's not been going well. I will tell you in my interview for my last full time position, um, the dean said, and he was teaching um, genetics and he said, I love the flip classroom format, but I've never been able to get it to work. And I said, you have to be more stubborn than your students. And that's kind of the bottom line. Like you have to continually push it back to them and be like, I already know this material. What do you want to know about the material? Let's, let's go with those ideas. So anyhow, thank you for having me. I've, I've enjoyed being here and uh, hope to see you around.